Hello and welcome to 515 Radio. I'm Tom Hotka, president and dictator for life of 515comics.com. With me today is Trey Peterson, or Professor Trey, as he's better known. How we doing, guys? And also with us today uh, to act as moderator, Maddie Martin. I'm under the blankets where it's safe. So thank you all for tuning in for this uh, special podcast event. We haven't done a lot of radio shows recently, but this Christmas, December 24th, I think, Christmas Eve, is going to be the 8th anniversary of Nextus, the Search for the Ocean Shard, as it appears in the comic today. Uh, and so we thought that we would get together. We did this three years ago to commemorate five years of Nextus. We decided to get together again this year uh, and talk a little bit about how far the comic has come in the past three years, and now it's been eight years of Nextus, and that's, that's just a silly long time. And in three years, we've warp speeded to where we are now. It's really picked up. I listened to the, the first podcast again, the five-year podcast, and one of my main complaints was I didn't feel like enough pages had come out, and I was really upset about that. Yeah, we fixed that problem. Um, and uh, at five years, we were just starting the 10th chapter of Nextus, and three years later, we are now starting the 22nd chapter of Nextus. So uh, we've, done, we've done over 10 chapters worth in three years, which, yeah, it, did, it feels pretty good. <laughs> That's not a bad number. And a lot has happened. Yeah, definitely. I would say the story is definitely picked up, not just in me being consistent with the updates, but also I think a lot more has been happening in the story, which is good. I'm happy about that. Yay! What else has happened? You got married. <laughs> I got married. I was cool. Yeah, I still like that. So that's fun. Yeah. Um, Not regretting that life decision. Yeah, no. No, that's still cool. We're still good. Uh, I think more important than you getting married is you've released book two. I did release book two. Yes, that is, that's right. That's, where are our priorities? Way to stay topical, man. <laughs> where are our priorities? So yeah, book two came out. So the first ten chapters are now in print, which is very exciting. I don't know when we're going to do the next next two's podcast, but hopefully at least book three will have come out by the time we do that one. Oh, it's got to be in two years because you're going to hit the 10th anniversary. That's true. Okay, it's so gotta yeah. It's got to be at least 2016. All right. And yeah, book three will be out by then. So so that's good. Yeah. So every time a book comes out, uh, maybe we'll do it. I don't know. Whatever. It doesn't matter. So yeah. So it's going to be like high school we reunions. We do these when we feel like doing them. We do them. these when we feel like doing them. It's going to be like high school reunions. You celebrate every five or so, but then after you hit about 20 years, then you're just going to have to do every year. Yeah. <laughs> Can you believe we're still doing this? <laughs> Straight dead yet? No, no. Uh, but he's in the hospice. Uh, so he's pooping in a blanket. In 20 years? <laughs> I guess. Sure, why not? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this time around, we polled you, our audience, for content because we didn't know what the hell to talk about. So we asked you guys to come up with some questions that you may have for, uh, for Trey and I. Uh, and so Maddie is going to go ahead and uh, kind of introduce those questions to us now. We'll just kind of take them one at a time and just uh, run down the list there. All right, well, from. Doodlebot Pop from DeviantArt asked you guys, the, these are, uh, depending on the question, some of them are for both of you, some of them I can even answer to, they show. Yeah, so. if you want to weigh in on any of them, go ahead. <laughs> okay. All right, out of all the characters that have happened thus far, who has gone through the most changes as far as design, personality, or plot significance goes? Yeah. So, I was thinking about these questions earlier today, because I was like... I, I was thinking about them since you sent me that email. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, ah. And that was days ago that you sent me this email. Yeah. You're like, peruse this. You read. And I'm like, I got no answer still. This is <laughs> all of them? Well, definitely, like, I would say before the comic actually started, that... A lot of the characters went through some serious changes in design and direction and plot significance and all that. And so, yeah, like kind of all of them, really. I mean, unless they were developed specifically for this run of the comic. So I decided instead I I figured that my answer for this would probably be L, just because when she first appeared in the comic, like in chapter, what, three, I think she shows up. She was the first, like, dedicated female character. I was really uncomfortable writing female characters. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do with her. 
And so she has she's changed a lot just uh, as far as like how I write her, what I actually want her character to do. And then yeah, her design has gone through a lot of changes just as I've gotten more comfortable drawing female characters. You know, there's not a lot of female characters in next to because I'm not as comfortable drawing ladies. I'm just not as good at it. You're and getting so, better at it. Yeah. And so I would say that, that she's probably changed the most, like, as what people can see in the comic. What about the Wayward Cry Council? What about them? Well, they kind of went through some changes, because at first, they were, I think they were, when you and I wrote it originally, I think they were just going to be, like, hooded, mysterious individuals in this kind of, like, dark meeting room and then it was like was it you that approached me and was like hey could you just kind of come up with the designs for these and i kind of came up with some like one-offs for each of the different characters yeah because we we discussed the need for this group of way cry that we were going to have show up and i yeah i think that was the original idea that it was just going to be very nondescript and they were all just going to kind of look like kind of look like the hooded man where it's like just people wearing masks like and cloaks but uh, but yeah, I think it was actually your idea to to kind of spice them up a little bit and sort of have them represent different key factions or different key elements from society, which I think fits a lot better and, and looks more interesting. It's certainly a lot more fun to draw, and we've gone on to use those characters again because they're freaking cool. <laughs> so so yeah, that's probably a pretty big change. Woo! Go me! Yeah, way to go! <laughs> I contributed. <laughs> Has there been any characters that have changed the very least from the start? 115? 115 hasn't changed too much. I, again, like, everybody's changed in little ways, like, as I've just gotten more comfortable drawing them. Um, and I feel like I've streamlined a lot of 115, and he used to have kind of, like, a weird, like, bubbly shape on his chest that made it look like he had, like, a, a heart there instead of instead of it just looking like a piece of armor. So, so there have been elements <laughs> in his design that have changed a lot. But yeah, as far as like character goes, he hasn't changed too much. But I would say probably the least amount of change is got to be like the Knicks, specifically like Roy and Tony. Like RJ's had a little bit. Of, I've decided to kind of humanize him a little bit more. We talked about this on the last podcast. How it's like he's, you know, we're kind of spending more time with him and sort of seeing what he's going through. But Roy is like. He's a jerk, and he likes being violent, and that's pretty much how he's always been. And aside from getting better clothing design, which again is just a drawing thing, I don't think that his character design has changed much at all. So that was probably my pick. I figured it would have been something like Carlton. Actually, that's a really good one, because... He hasn't. He hasn't changed, changed at all. At all. Except for he's married and has a wife and who has yeah. awesome tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> was that a change from your original idea? Um, she was... I, don't, I, I think in the first like about page entry for Carlton, I alluded to the fact that he was married. I didn't know if it was ever going to be something that came up in the comic. And it just sort of... It just kind of happened that there was a good opening for that. And I decided to do some fun with the character, but... But yeah, Carlton, like the first sketch of Carlton, I think is up in the extras, and he pretty much looks exactly the same. Like, I was really happy with how he looked, and I didn't have to do anything. So yeah, that's actually, that's probably the best example of them all. <laughs> Good job, Maddie. Yeah. All right, well, as uh, as the creators of Next Juice, what kind of stuff do you enjoy seeing the most from fans, such as maybe questions, fan art, fan fiction, or maybe even just the fact that you're getting any kind of like feedback whatsoever i mean or anything like that so what's my favorite thing to get from readers is there fan fiction you know what i don't have any fan fiction right now and and i thought about that when i saw the question is like that's be open to that like i i would love that but the thing is is that i think that fan fiction has to be for fans exclusively like, if someone wrote fan fiction for Nextus, until I'm done with the project, I don't think I could read it. Even if there's something, like, kind of similar to something I want to do with the story, I, you know, like, if... I, then I, I'm on the hook, so to speak. It's like, right. oh, well, you read this, and then you used my idea. It's like, ah, but I was going to do that anyway. Ah. So I, I've, I've seen other webcomic artists and just other authors talk about how they've received fan fiction from people, and they're like, we're really grateful... We can't read it. So I, I would be flattered and honored if someone wrote fan fiction. Now, that said, Maddie, <laughs> you have written yeah. 
I have written several sub chapters and like side stories for next twos. And in fact, just today you were talking about an idea for another kind of sub chapter. And that I think of as being a, a little bit different because it's it's less that you're like I just wrote up this story in the same setting and universe with your characters, and more of a hey, I thought maybe this is something an idea that you could use, and of course. I would make sure that you were okay with me using it before I went ahead and used it. So, uh, long story short, fan fiction would make me feel really great, but I don't think I could actually read it until I was, like, done with this story. So, that leaves, you know, people asking questions, people giving fan art, and people just, in general, leaving feedback, which I love all of those things. Um, They make me so happy. I I think that my favorite thing is, is answering questions when people leave a comment and have a question about how something works in the universe or how a character works, some some little aspect about a character. If I can answer it, if it's not, like, plot significant, I love doing that, like, because that helps me, too. Like, if I don't know, then it makes me stop and think, like, well, how does that work? Or, or what is the functionality of that? Uh, and it helps me be a better storyteller, and it's fun. I love it. When people ask a question about the plot or something, and we're going to address it, and it's like, we can't say. That means that they're hooked, they're interested, and they want to know what happens next. It's like, well, I can't tell you. You're just going to have to wait till we get there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That does that does kind of show that people are, are into it. I hadn't thought of it that way. I, I usually feel bad saying, like, I, I can't tell you anything, but you're right. That is true, that if someone's asking about what's going to happen next or guessing at what's going to happen next, it's because they're excited to see what's going to happen next. Do all of those things, please. And especially <laughs> badass fan art. Oh, man. Sometimes we get, like, these great submissions, and we're just like, Tom, you're fired. Yeah. We're hired this guy. Yeah. That's that's why it's not my favorite thing. Like I <laughs> I love getting fan art, but sometimes it drives me up the wall because I'm like, why aren't you drawing my comic? Because we don't have millions of dollars to pay these people to do that. Alas. Well, the events revealed so far, who or what were you the most excited to have or happen or appear in the comic and why? Like, maybe a, fi- a situation you finally got to put out there or a character you finally got to reveal or maybe even just a name that you've gotten a chance to say in the comic yeah this one was really tough to think about there are so many yeah as good points as trey can attest there in the past 10 chapters there have been so many things that we've hit that we came up with the idea for years before and so it's so exciting to actually like get this stuff out there and actually like have these scenes happen and it's hard to pick a favorite. It is. <laughs> um, um, There's the true mark getting shot down, and that whole hullabaloo. I think that one was the one that like had me the most giddy. And I, I agree. I, I kind of got stuck on the on the 115 missile launcher scene in, uh, I think it's chapter 12, where there's all this build up, and he's got this big missile launcher, and he's never fired a gun before, and it's like, okay, I'm going to do it. And then he shoots it backwards through the true mark. Like, that... Was really, really... Uh, spoilers, by the way, if you haven't read the comic. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> womp, womp. <laughs> but yeah, that that was something that I wanted to see so bad ah. since we first wrote it. And I think I was most excited about that. I mean, there have been things before and after that that I've been really, really excited about. I mean, just, just at the end of Chapter 10 when, like, finally there's some convergence of all of these myriad storylines and all these different characters and it's like oh this is how they're all going to like get squashed together like that makes me really happy mm-hmm. laren like 115 first interacting with a daunt that was very exciting for me and just getting to draw a daunt in the comic as a character was very fun so i mean there've been a lot but i really think that it comes back to that i was doing a little bit of research before we started recording and Trey and I, in 2009, recorded a podcast talking about Next Mm Tues. It's like the first three years of it. Yeah. But one of the things that we talked about, one of the things we teased at the end, is that soon you'll get to see how 115 can fire a missile launcher. (laughs) Yeah, we did do that. And that was like (laughs) five full years before it actually came out in the comic. Like, we were excited about it for that long. So, So I think that was probably the biggest moment for me. When we name dropped Roz, we've had him in oh, the yeah. works for a while now, at least a, a year, if not a couple years. Yeah, 
we're still a ways away yet from introducing him, but uh, he should be really, really fun to work with. Yeah, actually, you know, that whole Wayward Cry Council scene, I mean, that's where they brought up Roz. Uh, uh-huh. That whole scene, I think, was was just a lot of fun to do, like, really to see more of the Wayward Cry, to see how they operate, to learn more about the Hooded Man, also known as the Outsider, uh, and kind of what he's up to, because it's still, I mean, you know, it's very... It's a little ambiguous. It's clear that uh, nobody really wants him to do whatever it is that he's going to do. But anyway, I mean, yeah, so that that was a good scene just because there was a lot of, like, planting for, like, hey, we're going to be referencing stuff that's happening here a lot in the future. I don't know. Any, anytime I've really gotten to do any of that, uh, any of the, like, history of the Way We Cry stuff, I mean, because for the most part, the Way We Cry are very secondary because they're, you know, they're not main characters. Right. And so it's kind of cool to see some of their some of their history, but it hasn't been important to the plot thus far thus far so it's been nice to you know what was it chapter 19 i think 19 or 20 where Koch is explaining to randall all of the like history of the way we cry and actually talking about the ocean chart a little bit and it's like hey hey there's some there's some cool stuff that's something cool like getting to actually talk about the ocean chart and the comic the search for the ocean chart so i really like the introduction of kels just because it's you know, you've introduced several ways and stuff, but you haven't shown what their society is really like secretly. But you get a you get an introduction of a character who is someone who is pretty much assigned to find information. Yeah. And, you know, be, play behind the scenes, which is a character that I'm writing a story for, for you, for your book and stuff yeah. like that. So <laughs> it's a character that really, sh- like... The character that I, I didn't think too hard of when you first created her, but after probably a year and a half or so of her introduction, really like going back and reading, started really digging in that those ideas. So I think that was a good character. That was someone that really I was excited to see. Other than that, I mean, I really liked that chase in the desert. Yeah. Uh, but I also thought uh, a scene that I actually appreciated more than even all of that was just the the drive. In the back of Laren's truck. Which oh. is something I just enjoyed. I'm glad you liked that. That's funny because that's like... I, I basically wrote that scene that way because... Like in middle school when some of these characters were first floating around in my head... Like what I would think about would be like these characters all like being in a party. Because I was big into Final Fantasy VII. I think we've talked about that before as a big mm-hmm. influence. But... Of all these characters just, like, riding around, waiting to get to the next place where the action was going to happen, and that's where the character interaction happens, and that's where they, like, get to kind of feel each other out and, like, talk and learn about one another and, like, grow as a party. And so I always really liked that, and so, like, that was, like, a literal representation of that scene from from my mind, <laughs> is, okay, they got to sit in a truck and talk for a while, so what are they going to talk about? I'm glad you like that. That's cool. You know, you bringing that up, just character interactions and stuff like that, makes me think about everything Dugan has either relayed to uh, Arik or when he was sitting there having a beer with uh, Randall and just talking about the old times and how things yeah. used to be. Those are really cool kind of character interactions, too. I really like those. Yeah, me too. What has been your favorite part of these eight years with Nexus? Okay, so since that's... Similar to the question that we just answered, I figure anything basically that's happened like outside of the comic itself, but just anything in these past eight years. Yeah, that's what I was taking from that too, yeah. And for me, it it probably has to be, I mean, there's a lot of really great things that have happened, but if I had to pick my favorite, it would be looking at book one for the first time when I got the first proof. I mean, that really blew me away. There was a lot of work. It was really cool to see like a physical copy of my comic for the first time, but there there have been so many other great things that have happened too. So it's it's hard to it's hard to pick, but that I think that's definitely up there. I'd agree. I'd say your book party. Yeah, it's probably that too. Same thing, but it's well similar. But I would say your book party was your first book. Your book party for book one was probably one of the coolest things I think you've done. We've gone to a lot of conventions. Probably our first convention is always a memorable one. But probably the fact of getting together, having your family and stuff all over. And you having just stacks of your guys' creation yeah. all over the place, walking around, not really having a whole lot of time to talk to everybody or details, 
because you're busy ta- uh, trying to explain to everyone what this is, or, yeah. you're, or you're <laughs> both have a, a, a metallic silver sharpie in your hand signing all these books for everybody. That was pretty cool. Yeah. That party was off the chain. Yeah. That was pretty fun. I yeah. actually really enjoyed that. Indeed. You need to throw another party like that. Indeed. Well, like book three. Knew. I've decided it's going to be the odd books are going to have big parties and the even books will have small parties. Since that's what we've done so far. <laughs> why, why not? It's going to be... Yeah, a bit yeah. the, my absolute favorite thing, and it still happens whenever we're at a con, when you meet someone new who has read your comic online and is so excited to meet you, every time it's just like, that's that's Awesome. Yeah, it, it's really hard to put into words, really. Uh, the kind of feeling you get like, yeah, we put something out on the internet and someone read it and really liked it and came here to see us. Yeah, that is that is a pretty amazing feeling. And, and it's happened a couple times now and it's, yeah. I don't think I'll ever get tired of, <laughs> of people saying, hey, it's you guys. <laughs> like, like, that's... It's pretty. Well, that uh, could that could mean a couple things, but they're like, "Oh, it's you guys, cool." Yeah, you hopefully not. Stuff here. It's not someone. Hey, it's you guys that owe me a bunch of money. It's, it's you guys that make that awesome comic. <laughs> that, that feels good. Yeah. A tad mad from DeviantArt asked you guys when you started, or relatively early in the making process. How clear were the oncoming chapters? How clear was the ending? So I guess we've talked about this too beforehand. Is and you fully admitted to it. I think even on the previous ones. That technically, if you followed straight from what you started, comic would be over. Uh, not exactly. So wasn't um, it only about 20 to 30 chapters was going to be the, the lifespan of the comic? That's what I thought, but I really, I mean, at that point, I wasn't, you know, I had just gotten to chapter 10, and I'm like, oh yeah, we're going to cover a lot of ground by the time, yeah, no. So that was maybe a little unrealistic of a, of a uh, guesstimation. When I, when I first started, I mean, like, before even Trey started helping me co-write, like, the first four chapters were not particularly clear. I did not... I knew I wanted to have an ending, but I didn't have an ending written. I didn't really have much of a timeline written. I just knew the events that were going to happen in the first four chapters. Eh, maybe the first five chapters. I had pretty well figured out. But then, much further beyond that, I had a very loose timeline of events before Trey and I just started swapping ideas and really cranked out the next timeline. So yeah, when I first started, uh, the ending was not clear. All I knew is that I wanted it to end. Oncoming chapters, basically, it was just like I had you know, stopped and started the comic a couple of times and just knew pretty much how I wanted to start it. And so that's, that's the only reason I was able to write those first chapters on my own as I did. It was just because I already had a pretty good idea what I wanted to do. I have nothing to add. Yeah. You've also mentioned this one, too. The question is, has the ending changed? I, I guess I want to go in a little more descriptive of that. If yeah. you don't feel like uncomfortable answering this one, you guys don't have to, but obviously the last chapter is not written. It's not extensively planned out. You have an outline. You have an idea. Has your imagined ending right now, what you see as the ending, has that changed from eight years? Oh, yeah. Yeah, big time. Okay. Yeah, definitely the <laughs> ending has changed. And it's it, actually, Trey and I were just talking about the ending a couple weeks ago when we were writing chapter 22, when we were kind of going through chapter 22 together. The way that we, we come up with a script is we kind of do a timeline, and then each time I need to write the next script, when I'm almost done with a chapter, I'll just kind of sit down and look at that timeline and kind of carve out a chunk of it and be like, here's the events that I want to have happen in the next chapter. So our timeline does not yet reach to the end. It reaches pretty far. But it doesn't reach to the end. And so Trey and I were actually talking about that a little bit. I mean, years and years ago, we've we've talked about elements that are going to be at the end or very near the end. But but definitely it's it's changed a bit. And just as the comic continues to tell itself, there are, you know, different things where it's like, you know what, this could be something that would work. Or this could be something that maybe we could add this in. Kind of going with that, I've been kind of surprised with how fluid the whole kind of thing is that the... the, the writing process because there are definite moments when we find ourselves going well that's not going to work anymore because of what this happened and so in a way the comic kind of writes itself at yeah. times well yeah if if you if there's something that's in the timeline like because all the timeline is i mean it's basically like we call it a skeleton i call it a skeleton all the time and it's just you know it's like you just write 
characters A and B do this, and here's the result. And maybe there's a line of dialogue if there's something particularly that we want someone to say. But nothing is, like, really fleshed out. It's just the bare bones of A, B, C, and D. D. And that's it. So if there's something that it's like, oh, that doesn't make sense anymore, it's just, oh, well, what would? And it's really easy to write in that kind of shorthand. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's harder once you actually have to sit and, like, write out the chapter. But then you've got all of the chapters before that that have led up to it, and it's like, okay, well, what would make sense for these characters to do, or how would it make sense for this situation to to kind of play out? So, And that kind of answers the next question. It does. It does. It's, all, it's fine. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. If you've if there been, I mean, obviously, you guys mentioned the way that you guys kind of did create and design those ways, uh, the way council and stuff, as you were introducing them mm-hmm. before it. Other than them, technically, are there any characters that you've created last minute? There've been a few, and like we already kind of touched on, like Melody, like Carlton's wife, I was not really planning on on having her in the comic. I thought it would be fun, but it didn't think it was necessary. But then chapter 13 rolls around. I got a scene where Carlton needs to be interacting with someone. It's like, oh, why not his wife? Why not? Sure, whatever. So came up with a design really quick, like as I was writing the the chapter. And Kels was actually kind of the same way. I I had the I think I came up with the the original design for Kelsa, Anime Iowa, the one year that we went to Anime Iowa. That explains the onesie. Yeah. <laughs> I I wanted there to be kind of a way that was less of a hunter tracker like Ezekiel and less of uh just more of a, a violent character and more of a spy. And yeah, so the design came and then there was a place to put her and it, it was not like a long-term character goal or anything. No. So. But I don't know. I mean, were there any... Have there been any characters that showed up that you were like, oh, I didn't know we were going to do that? Like, Who was the guy that sold the Syriad uh, Nitro Cannon? The little roach guy? Oh, yeah. I <laughs> loved that guy because the whole idea of something being alien is it being foreign and weird. And you encapsulated that with that character. A sentient being that looks like a too many legged cockroach selling, de- pawning off this Syriad Nitro Cannon. The fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I liked him too. I don't know, what did we call that guy? We had a name for that guy. Vic. 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 That's right, Vic. <laughs> it was such a pedestrian name too, Vic. Yeah, well, you know. It's... Well, that's because his alien name is really Vish. Yeah, I guess he was he was kind of a, a last minute ad of like, oh yeah, I'll have a flashback and I'll show this weird little bug guy. <laughs> I saw that and was like, wow, I didn't expect that. But yeah, otherwise, otherwise, no. I, I think I think most of them are supposed to be there. <laughs> yeah. This is from Long Shanks from Deviant Art. I feel like this comic is still at its beginning. How big is this story going to be? It's going to be as big as it gets. <laughs> I think that in a lot of ways that the comic has had a lot of like false starts because it's the search for the ocean shard and there's been a lot of other stuff happening. We, it's just how I tell stories. I can't help but tell like five or six different stories all at once and then have them converge in some way or maybe not. So because of that, you know, and because of like big events like the True Mark crashing, like that could have been, oh, here's the start, all the characters are together, and now, poof, we're on our way, but oh wait, no, we crashed, and we gotta go back to where we just were so that we can start over again. And so I think that that might be kind of what he's talking about, is that now, now it really feels like, okay, like, we're getting ready to start again. And, and I, think that that's, I think that that's a fair assessment, or at least that's how I see it. I don't know if that's how he sees it. Uh, but how big is the story gonna be? Well, Trey's right. It's gonna be about as big as it needs to be to get the story done. I hesitate to make another guesstimation of how many chapters since I was very wrong last time. Oh, God, yeah. Um, um, but I like to think that we're probably about a third of the way into the story. Ish. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I think 50 would be a really great chapter to shoot for as the end, but I don't know that I can be as clean as that. It's going to it's gonna take how long it's going to take. But yeah, no, I, I think that probably probably we're about a third of the way through the story, as far as I can tell. Like I said before, it's it's very fluid, so things might change just depending on what happens. And yeah, stuff has gotten added in. I mean, as we've definitely. done, there have yeah. been scenes that have been added in because it's like I realize, oh, 
there's something that hasn't been explained and it would be good if I did that and here's a good time to do it and these characters have been introduced so they can do it. Like, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to rephrase this one. Okay. Have you thought of any projects you'd like to do after you finish Next Who's? You know, a couple people have asked me this and I really am not sure. You know, this storyline, The Search for the Ocean Shard, is definitely really big. And it's going to take me a long time to finish it. And so I don't want to say that I'll be ready to like jump in and do more next two stories or more stories set in the same universe. But I certainly could. I mean, you know, we we were just talking about how we've gone out of our way to slowly explain this setting. And that's because it's something that we've been developing for a long time. I would be totally cool with doing more comics in this setting. Uh, I've thought about doing uh, doing some uh, like some different takes. Actually, I think in the last podcast we were talking about you know there's the Carthen War, there's the War on Nextus with the Daunts. You know, I mean those would be interesting stories to tackle. At this point, I think it would be really fun to do something more military themed, and so I think that it would be really cool to tackle some kind of war in the same universe because I like science fiction. I'm probably always going to do science fiction. And I like this universe that has been created. So I, I will very likely keep doing stuff in this universe, even if it's with different characters or different settings. But, uh, but yeah, so, so I don't know. What are you going to do? Make lots of money. <laughs> oh, that's the right answer. I forgot. I never thought that this was the whole story. I know. I always thought the, uh, the Ocean Shard was just one adventure, and this was going to be a, a, a book about several adventures. Ah. That is how I've always envisioned this when you thought about this eight years ago. That's why I always wondered why it was waiting so long to get started. Things because I honestly thought that the series was Nextus, and the search for the Ocean Shard was just Tom's first adventure. Right. Oh, so that is like... how I always looked at it. I always thought that maybe every ten chapters, like every like every ten chapter, was an adventure. I've, and it, it took me a long time to realize this, that no, this entire story is your story you were wanting to tell. I always took this comic as, they're treasure hunters, the next one will be our sequel of our story that we're going to tell in this universe, and then another one after that and stuff. I had no idea that this was the story. Even thinking about that question, what are you going to do after... Even now, I don't know. I don't. I don't really see next to ever finishing. Not in a way of it's taking too long, but as in a way of I don't see you doing anything after next to. I don't want you to. <laughs> after this story completes, I want to see another adventure. Well, I hope that you still feel that way when I finish the story. <laughs> well, that's that's. I honestly, I mean, that's kind of what the title is all about. Like, I I meant it to be kind of like an Indiana Jones and the you yeah. Know, that's like, how I always took it. Um, I was, I was gonna just, say Hardy Boys, but yeah, or whatever. Hardy Boys. Yeah, no, that <laughs> that's same same principle though, where it's like, here's your setting, here's what the actual adventure of today's episode is, and yeah, that's that's kind of the idea of the search for the ocean shard. And I mean, when I did that side story, the Rama Central Emerald, that's it, that's why it was titled that way. It's next to the search for the Rama Emerald. Because it's kind of in that same vein. And I don't know, I, I would like to, you know, like right now, if I had to answer right now, I'd say yes, I definitely want to keep doing more next two stories. Wh whether it be following these treasure hunters or whether it be with some other characters, I would love to do more treasure hunter stories, even like more like Randall in his heyday, like before the Ocean Shard. But I don't know. I mean, the thing is, is that it's been eight years since I started this comic. It's going to be at least another eight years before I'm done. And I don't know who I'm going to be then. And I don't know what I'm going to want to do. So it's it's hard for me to speculate on that right now. Ultimately, I, I agree with you, though. I do kind of want to be doing next to forever. Because I like it. There, I mean, I read comics. There are some independent creators that, you know, they flat out say, I'm never going to stop doing it. And when I do... Well, that's going to be a sad time in my life. <laughs> there are some people who look and say, my comic doesn't have an end. Yeah. Because I'm always going to be doing it. So, I don't know. I've always kind of looked at it that way nowadays. It took me a long time to get out of that idea that this is the comic. This is this is the adventure. This isn't a multi-adventure right now. This is the adventure. This right, is yeah. the story that's being yeah, told. Yeah, next is the search for the ocean shard. We'll have an end. But that, you know, that's this story. So, in a way, it's like, it's what you thought it was, but it's just 
really long. <laughs> it's just a really long episode. <laughs> well, and a lot of important stuff happens in this. Uh, it's yeah, and it's and it's kind of meant to be like. I, I like the idea of doing the small episodes. Like that's why I really like doing the Ramos Emerald, and I'd love to do more stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But it, the reason I don't is because the Search for the Ocean Shard is a huge story with a lot of elements in it. And so, yeah, you're right. A lot of stuff happens. A lot of important things happen, and a lot of big things happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because of that, it's like, well, like you know. I, I kind of missed the boat on making it uh, an episodic comic where I can just be like, oh, hey, they found this, and now it's on to the next adventure. Which, ideally, I mean, that, that would be a great way to do a comic series. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, it's, it's always been difficult for me not to tell epics. It's just, like, the only way I know how to write. So <laughs> If you've read any of my previous comics, it's the same deal. Well, Mikey... Geek from Facebook Geek. says <laughs> he's gonna love that. What can you tell me about the political climate of Nexus? I feel pretty neutral about the Dons, but I really want to have 115s back. Oh yeah. If you read the comic, you probably would want 115s back. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't be too neutral about the Dons. They kind of just say, "Give us your stuff." Yeah. Or we will kill you. Well, and that's that's exactly <laughs> it. But in the in the comic itself. They're not all bad. There's there's not been a whole lot of like discussion about the Dons. All we know is 115's point of view. And I talked to Mikey about this a little bit, and he, he told me, he's like, you know, from what I can see, uh, Nextus is still fine. It's not like the Dons enslaved everybody or no, anything like they're, that. They're just, they're, they're the Britons colonizing the world, essentially. In essentially. In such respects. I mean, they, you know, they took what they wanted. They, t- they, they claimed it for themselves. And, you know, but the people, the natives, they still live their lives, yeah. essentially. Yeah, they, they, just had to they don't really govern. Them. They just make sure that they get what they're supposed to get yeah. in resources. And so, yeah, so... Uh, so that's that's the political climate of Nextus, uh, essentially, is that the vast majority of people who live there are not really affected. By yeah, it. it's not it's not a huge deal. There's plenty of people who hate the Daunts, plenty of people who wish that uh, it wasn't a Daunt planet and it weren't conquered. But for the most part, it does not have a huge effect on most people's lives. You know, so there's and and I think I think you're right. I think that it's a bit realistic as to how a lot of colonization, like on Earth you know, in our history has happened, there are definitely people who move against the oppressors and who move against the colonizers. But for the most part, like, the general population uh, may just be able to, like, part of my resources that I create go to these people instead of those people. Whatever, I'm still a farmer. Or whatever, I'm still a fisherman. But... That being said, there are definitely people on Nextus who are actively trying to change that. The main force is the Nix. The Nix does not like having to share resources. And so one of their big things is trying to find ways to make it so that the Daunts leave and don't come back to Nextus. But that's not the focus of the story, and so you don't hear about it a lot in the story. So that's that's basically the idea, is that most people living there... Don't really have a problem with the Daunts, and the Daunts aren't, they don't have, like, malice towards the people that they conquer. It's basically, they just keep an eye on them and make sure they get what it is that they want. Mm -hmm. There you go. So you can have 115s back. I mean, the Daunts aren't great guys. There's a reason why they own a giant chunk of the galaxy. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're good at killing people. So With with two fingers. With two fingers, even. (laughs) Well, Mike also asks, what's with the wave masks? Are they symbolic? Do the different wave masks mean something or represent something about the person that wears it? So, originally, the answer would be no. They, they just, were all the same mask. They, they used to all be the same mask, and it was just that they looked cool. And That's since changed. Yeah. That's definitely since changed. I think I'm going to use a really geeky <laughs> analogy here. Do it. But a Jedi Padawan makes his own lightsaber, right? So each one's going to be kind of individualistic to that Jedi. Well, it's kind of the same principle. Each mask is going to be definitely up to the wearer and what their personality type is like and 
you know, how they wish to represent themselves amongst the ways. I remember originally when it was just the normal old way mask. And was it me that started playing around with the design, or was it you? No, it was you, because when you came up with the uh, the council designs, they were all over the place, and I was like, oh, I never really considered changing them. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is not really a question, but I would really like to drink with Dugan. He seems legit. You wouldn't last a night. <laughs> Mikey G, Dugan would drink you under the table, and if Stoles was with him, you'd be in the hospital. It smells <laughs> like petrol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I mentioned it in the commentary on the pages uh, of the recent chapter with Dugan, uh, Stoltz, and 115 all drinking, that uh, Dugan is kind of based on a friend of ours who's very much talk to anybody, very friendly, very able to, like, get people to, you know, to hang out and do whatever. And, yeah, no, I think I think Dugan's pretty legit. Uh, if I were a drinker, I would drink with Dugan as well. Indeed. Well, the final question is from Carter Allen on Facebook. Oh, actually, we've got a couple other questions. Oh, do we? Good. All right, yeah. Well, from Carter, are there any characters that have taken a life of their own and altered their arcs and involvement in the overall story? I mean, all the characters have sort of started to write themselves. I mean, like, like Trey and I were talking about before, you know, what is already written sort of helps to dictate what will be written next. You know, just however the characters have come across in previous chapters sort of help to determine how they're going to react to situations in the future. So in a way, they've all kind of started to take on a life of their own and alter their arcs. I don't know. Did you have anything else to add to that, I guess? Wasn't Stoltz supposed to be just kind of a side character, and then he kind of, or did we always think he was gonna? Yeah, I think originally he was gonna be, he was gonna be just, uh, just kind of in like those early chapters, just to kind of help set up the Knicks a little bit. But then it was he was just someone who was handy, who was like, oh, we could keep using him. Yeah, he's probably changed a little bit that way, but. I don't. I don't think I have a really good answer to that. I I love that question, but I don't think I have a really good answer to it. Outside of anything else we've already talked about. Sorry. Sorry, Carter. <laughs> we'd, we'd answer more, but that would give stuff away. And then, yeah, here's the last minute questions from my wife. What were your hopes, dreams, goals for Nextus when it was the first conceived, and how has it evolved or changed today? So, Nextus 2006 compared to Nextus 2015. I would say that when I started the comic, I did not have a lot of aspirations. And I, I've talked about this a little bit before, that when I was first doing it, it was just for me, and I didn't care if other people read it. It was just something for me to do. And also, uh, I did not set goals for myself. I didn't know what I was going to do in five years. I didn't know what I was going to do in ten years. I didn't really have a lot of aspirations for the comic other than I liked making comics. But now, it's like, yeah, I, I want to... I want to see it through to the end. I know I'm going to be working on it for the next five years and beyond that. And I want it. I, I want to see where it can take me. I want to. I want it to be big. I want it to be a thing. I want it to be something I can share with a lot of people. The books are a big step for that, and I want to keep doing those. And I'd. I'd just love to see what else I can turn it into. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> when I first kind of got on. As your co-writer, you had already gone through several different iterations of The Horrible Adventures of El Roy, and mm -hmm. uh, you'd also been doing Not Quite Dreaming. Then you rebooted everything, and you, I think, had already done the first four chapters mm -hmm. at that point. It was like mid-chapter four, I think, is when, when you officially came on as co-writer. Because before, I had just kind of been like... I don't even think I was actually like proofreading anything or putting in solid input. You would just talk to me about things and be like, yeah, that's cool. Wouldn't it make sense if this happened? Or, you know, I think that was what I was doing at that point. Uh, it was just something fun to do, really. I, I always liked that about our friendship was that we could just sit there and talk about stories in our own little world for hours. And we would be entertained and damn it all if nobody else cared. We cared. So, um, I'm just, I was just happy then to kind of officially do a, be a part of something like that. Nowadays, I could see this getting turned into, I don't know, a animated series or something like that for, like, teens to adults. 
Uh, not necessarily for little kids, but teens to adults, definitely, yeah. Maybe Cartoon Network, Adult <laughs> Swim, or... Uh, Oh, you just removed some of the swear words. This is totally like an afternoon tsunami show. Oh, yeah. No, I think so. You totally have this be like a 5 o'clock Cartoon Network afternoon show. <laughs> well, that would be pretty amazing. I would I would not turn that down if that opportunity ever arose. I think that we've answered all of the questions that we received. Yes. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully you got good answers or... Uh, at least answers of some sort to your questions. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to this. Thank you again for for uh, contributing questions and giving us something to talk about for an hour. So I'd like to thank Maddie for coming, moderating, and weighing in. And thank you. Taking part in this. And I'd like to thank, of course, Professor Trey for coming by, dropping some knowledge on us all. And again, thanks to all of you for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Keep reading Nextus. We're going to keep making it. God damn it. Thank you.